We pick up in the middle of the story in the book of Acts today, the story of Paul. Paul, born in Tarsus, a big city, and so he had access to a, the finest education taught by, the, by Gamaliel. He was born a, of a good family, and that could trace his lineage back all the way into the history of the Jewish people. And he had moved to Jerusalem uh, and as an adult, and, and as an adult, he is now uh, in charge of cleaning up this problem that there are Jews who are obviously getting it wrong and talking about this Jesus fellow. He is uh, part of organizing the trial of Stephen, who uh, was the first Christian martyr, for he is found guilty of blasphemy. And Paul, or Saul, as he's called by other name, was the one who... Uh, sort of organized the crowd, held coats, while Stephen was stoned. And so uh, Paul uh, kicks off this first persecution of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, houses are raided, people are taken into jail. And once he's got that up and running, he heads out. He, he gets his uh, warrants, his arrest warrants, for anyone he finds who follows Jesus. And he heads out, and, and he's on the road to Damascus. And uh, Jesus and him have a discussion. And Jesus says, Paul, stop it. And, and Paul has to kind of ponder, who are you? And, and he, he understands who Jesus is. And he is sent into Damascus and temporarily blinded. And the most impressive person you'll hear about today is Ananias, or Ananias, because Ananias is the guy who goes and gets Paul. And uh, just think of how gutsy that is. Like, this is the Ananias who's told, go get Paul. And Ananias is, is like, the one who came to arrest me, who just killed people who, who believe what I believe, who started throwing people in jail, like that, that, that Paul? Yep, go get that Paul and bring him home and see how that goes. It'll work out just fine. And so that's what Ananias does, um, which is just impressive, very bold. Um, and then uh, Paul uh, turns his life in a new direction. The person who was most responsible for persecution of the church in the first decade then becomes the person most responsible for the spread of the church in the succeeding decades. Paul's gifts were powerful. He could write and organize, teach and inspire, and having first used them to persecute those who followed Jesus, he then used them to lead people to the good news of, of Jesus. And so this is one way that one story we look at in scripture that shows us a little bit about how people use their gifts. What is probably a little bit more familiar to most of us is a different story about uh, familiar not to our lives is the story uh, of the fishermen and how they use their gifts. Uh, Jesus is walking along the, the Galilee, um, <clears throat> the Sea of Galilee, and he comes across Simon and Andrew. Simon was also called uh, Peter, which is, so he's a, that's a Greek name, so him and his family have probably traveled some. But at this point, they've settled down at the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to be fishermen. And, and I, I don't think I've ever talked to a professional fisherman, but I'd be willing to guess that uh, being a fisherman is much like being a farmer. Once you've settled down into this land or this chunk of water, you, you kind of settle in. You're not going anywhere. You, you, this is going to be your, your area. And, and so they've settled in. That this is going to be the area they're going to work and serve in. And Jesus comes along and he invites them to do something different. He invites them and then James and John, other fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. He doesn't come to them and tell them to do something completely different with their lives. He says, you are going to keep on being fishers, but now you're going to catch something else in your nets. So these four, the first of the disciples, they're not that they have gifts, but it's not not like with Paul, where Paul is going in one direction and he makes a hard left and he goes in a completely different direction. This is uh, a this is the, the fishermen. You're, you're fishermen and you're serving in this area, and I want you to just do it in the name of Jesus. Now it's a, a slightly less hard turn. That might pro that's I'm guessing more familiar to, to the lives we lead. What we do see in both of these stories is that. 
Various people have various types of gifts. Paul had the gifts, the skills uh, of being able to travel and being able to communicate uh, good news, good public speaker, and Jesus calls him and he uses those gifts in a certain way. And the fishermen, they have gifts as well. Uh, we don't know a lot about, as much about them because we don't, they didn't write letters like Paul did. But we know that, for example, James settled down in Jerusalem and he helped build the mother church that made everything that Paul did possible. And so this is part of uh, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about when we join the Methodist Church, we commit to support it with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And this is the gifts part of it. Like everyone has gifts. How do we use the, those gifts? How, what are we committing to when we commit our gifts to the ministries and, and, and the work of the, the Methodist Church, the Methodist way of following Jesus? We, may, we might understand uh, gifts. Yes, we might have our experience of having gone one way in life and, and now we're using our gifts in a completely different fashion. Or, or maybe we're more like those fishermen. We've, we've been doing one thing and, and as we now follow Jesus, we're going to do it in a slightly different way. But either way, that, that's the, the point here is that we are called to use our, our gifts. That's what we're committing to as we join the church. And I think it's important to know that uh, Jesus never calls us to use a gift that we don't have. Paul was someone who was willing to travel and to speak in public, and so that's exactly what he continues to do. The fishermen don't stop fishing, they continue to catch, but it's just what they catch that changes. And I think that is true uh, of us. If you're a farmer, that we are still call, a farmer is still called to grow crops, that is, if you can never get any seed in the ground. But um, it might be also to raise a crop of Christian children. Or a teacher that follows Jesus still teaches, but might now teach a little bit differently. It might teach at the, at the school and then come and teach at the church to a church family. And you can go through it. And someone who is a carpenter, a manager, a plumber, and all the various trades that we, we do, all are, those are the, how we are using our gifts and they can all be used to the glory of God. Like, Jesus does, is not asking any of us to change who we are. We all have these gifts, and they can be gifts of the skills that we have, uh, cooking, farming, banking, carpentry, whatever. Uh, and they can be the attitudes we have. Some of us have the gift of patience. Some of us have the gift of humility. Some of us have the gift of gracefulness and kindness, right? It could be the experience we have that are our gifts, whether the experience are good uh, and have trained us and prepared us to serve, or they could be experiences that are really horrible, right? We can take a horrible experience if you have survived cancer, that's horrible that you had to go through it. But if that becomes what equips you to serve those who then have to grapple with cancer later in life, you are able to serve others who are grappling with that, that that's a gift. It's a, it's a way to redeem something that was horrible. And so we have the gifts, uh, we have the things we have, our time, our talents, our, our things, our reputation. Uh, I, I first of so all, I want you to hear very clearly today that you have God-given gifts, each and every one of you. And when we start talking about gifts, I'll tell you the sentence I hear most when we start talking about gifts. That's not my gift. You ever hear that? You ever say that? I, I know I have. Right? We, we start talking about what we're going to do or what the church might need to do. And, and I know I've said it myself. Like I, There are people who have the gift of working with very small children. It's not me. Right? That is not my gift. I, I just want them to listen to me, and, and it just doesn't, doesn't work. Right? It really doesn't. I, I take no joy in that. So, yeah, I, so there are points at which we say, you know, that's not my gift. Someone else needs to do it. Uh, and that, that is true. What is also true is when we start talking about how we're going to use our God-given gifts, sometimes there's, it's not that we don't have that gift. It's that we've not done it before. Right? And, and whenever we do something for the first time, it's really awkward. Now, if you think about those fishermen, uh, when uh, and Jesus calls uh, James and John those fishermen, the first time they're casting their nets and fishing for people, that, that probably was a touch awkward. The, the first time Paul gets up in front of a group of Jews and starts talking about Jesus, 
You think that was smooth? You think that was just like smooth sailing? Right? If you put first in front of anything, it gets a lot more awkward. And so there's a difference between saying that's not my gift and, and saying I'm not sure and I'm not willing to be uncomfortable to try it out. We, talk, we look at uh, Moses. We talked about Moses last week and uh, being present to what's going on. And, and Moses was present to God and God says to Moses, it's time for you to go talk to the Pharaoh about letting my people go. And what was Moses' immediate reaction? No. I got a stuttering problem, right? No, 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 no. And it is a hard ask, admittedly. Moses, you kind of stutter, but I want you to go use your skills and your gift of public speaking, and for your first audience, it's going to be Pharaoh. That would be a tough first audience. But if you fast forward a bit, when you were, fo were following Moses going, across the pro going to the promised land, leading the people, Moses talks in front of people again and again and again and again. Like all the time. That's what he does. He leads the people. He gets up in front and talks to them. And so when Moses is telling God, no, I can't do that, is it that he couldn't do it or that he really just didn't want to do it for the first time? Like we, we can look all across Scripture are people, but every time God calls somebody, their immediate response is, no, I can't do that. And God says, yes, you can. There's only one exception, and that's Mary. When God says uh, to Mary, you're going to have a kid, she goes, okay. That's really what makes Mary so impressive. But the rest of the time, and so the, if you were looking at how people uh, in Scripture respond to God's call to use their gifts, let's just be honest and say that no one is going to say, I think we, you should do that. No one is going to say, yes, I think that's a great idea. We are all going to say, I, no, no, I can't do that. No, 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 no. Right? I've said it. You've said it. We've all said it. It's not that we don't have the gifts. It's that we don't always want to be, we're not willing to be uncomfortable for the first time while we try to figure out what our gifts are. And I know this is true because I've found it in my own life. As you might know, I have a degree in biology. And when you get to be a, like a senior in college, what everyone starts asking you is, what are you gonna do after college? You get that question all the time. What are you going to do after college? What are you going to do after college, Andy? And as, a, as someone studying biology, there were two options. I can either go into lab work. Now, let me just tell you something about me and lab work. Some of you have, worked, have done lab work in, in high school or in college, and there's always that guy in the corner. Everyone else's reaction is, is boiling away, turning purple like it's supposed to do. And then there's that guy in the corner whose reaction is turning pink and not quite sure what's going on, and he's going to be there for an extra hour trying to redo the entire experiment? That's me. I have no clue why it happened. I understood what was happening, but I could never get my hands and the chemicals to work right. So I knew that I couldn't go into lab work as a living because I, I'm really bad at it. Okay, so if I can't go into lab work, what's the other thing you do with a, a, a degree in biology? Go be a doctor. Right? Go be a doctor. Here's what I told people again and again. I'd have a horrible bedside manner. I don't work well with people. I'm not very patient. Right? I, just, I would be really bad at helping people because I just don't get along with folk. There's a bit of irony there. Because then I went off to seminary because I wanted to study scripture. That's why I went to seminary. I wanted to read the Bible. And... Um, and I had no clue what else to do because I had a degree in working in the lab that I was bad at. And so I go off to seminary, and, and as part of being there, there was a set of churches I, I worked with, and I did things for the first time. I preached my first sermon, and I sat with people uh, and, and as they were struggling something for the first time. And I am thankful for Gethsemane United Methodist Church because they put up with me for a lot of firsts. And you know what? It was really awkward. I, was, I did some really stupid things. I'll tell you about a cantata sometime. You asked me about a cantata. They had to rewrite a cantata because I made an unfortunate word choice. Yeah, ask me about that later. But like, it is not that I didn't have skills or gifts to do this. It is that I had to do it for the first time. You gotta test it, right? You gotta try it. You gotta be willing to be uncomfortable right? and take a swing at it. And so I want you to hear, first, you each have amazing gifts. And second, to try out and figure out what those gifts are, 
could be a little bit uncomfortable. That's okay. It's worth doing. It's worth doing because there is nothing more satisfying than using a God-given gift, using it well, and to use it for what matters. Right? To know that you are doing something that matters to the glory of God and to be doing it well is just amazing. And so this, this is true of all, of all of us across all the ages. We all have gifts. It is all, it is always a good time to use them. It's always a good time to ask, how can I use them or use them more fully or develop them or refine them for the use of the following, how I follow Jesus. Each person in this church has a set of gifts that can make a difference in our lives and in the world. And so every person, that, and every person who walks in the door, like every time someone walks in the door that I've never seen before, it's like a big green package, like wrapped with a big red bow on it, is walking in, because I don't know what exciting gifts they bring, but it's going to be exciting. We just kind of see what they see what they're bringing. God has given all of us all the gifts we need. I believe that we have all the gifts we need for this church to do amazing and satisfying and transforming ministry to make a difference in our community, in our lives, and in our worlds. It's just a matter of using the gifts that we have and using them together as we follow Jesus. Amen.